Good evening. My name is Mark Elbiri, and I'm the director of the Head Neck Program at Emory. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, uh, Lauren Ottenstein, who's uh, the lead speech pathologist uh, here at the Emory Head Neck Program. Um, and it is our great pleasure to uh, present this webinar in honor of the film, uh, Can You Hear My Voice, uh, by acclaimed uh, uh, film producer, award-winning film producer, Phil Brummel, and um, in celebration of uh, National Cancer Survivors Day. And I think the film is a, a great example of some of the heroism that goes into surviving cancer. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Elliot Kalick, uh, who is a uh, senior sales executive at Rooms to Go, um, who is a, a long-term laryngectomy survivor. And then also uh, Janice Hayes, who actually had her laryngectomy before I even finished medical school. So she's been uh, with us for a long time oh. and probably can uh, tell us more about uh, living with the laryngectomy than almost anybody. Uh, it's hard to know how familiar folks are with uh, what a laryngectomy actually is, um, but I think uh, it's important to note that with head and neck cancer, oftentimes we talk about, well, I guess with other types of cancers, we talk about sort of, you can't live without your lungs, obviously you can't live without your pancreas, um, but so much of what makes us human is in the head and neck, and so much about our humanity is in uh, what we identify as ourselves as is in our voice and our ability to communicate. Um, and so I think head and neck cancer provides a very unique uh, uh, survivorship experience. And so I'm very excited to have the opportunity to, to participate in, in this uh, webinar. And uh, I'm really excited to uh, give folks the opportunity to watch the film, which is uh, a phenomenal film. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to show uh, for the audience a short video uh, demonstrating sort of what a laryngectomy looks like, what these patients experience. Uh, we're not going to dwell on it, but essentially it's removing the voice box and then bringing your trachea, which connects to your lungs, out to your skin, and then closing your swallowing tube so you can eat. So that's basically a laryngectomy in a nutshell. Um, uh, as you can see, folks breathe through their neck. And uh, one of the big questions is how we're able to restore speech. And there's actually a, a very nice uh, a prosthesis that can connect that swallowing tube and that speaking tube or the breathing tube um, that allows folks to talk. And that's how our panelists are able to communicate tonight. So. I just want to start with Bill because, you know, Bill approached myself and Dr. Adam Klein, who's the head of our laryngology group uh, a few months ago um, with this uh, incredible film. And I'd never had an opportunity. I, I wasn't aware of it. I hadn't had an opportunity uh, uh, to see it. And I just wanted Bill to sort of start out by talking about how, how did this how did this come about? Uh, how was this developed? Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Eldiri, and to Winship and Emory for hosting this webinar and a screening event. Um, the answer to that question is really born in my personal story. Um, my cancer journey started in 1997 when I was diagnosed with tonsil cancer that had spread to lymph nodes on the right side of my neck after undergoing a um, radical neck dissection, I endured aggressive radiation treatments. I empty dose over a wide field for seven weeks. After the treatment, life started to return to normal. I got on with my career in raising a young family. But over time, the long-term damage from the radiation treatments began to take a toll. By 2015, my larynx, trachea, and esophagus had all um, significant fibrosis or scarring. That resulted in labored breathing and speaking at levels just above a whisper. As those breathing difficulties increased, uh, my doctor, Dr. Utam Sinha, Medicine at USC, advised me that a laryngectomy 
was likely in my future. Now I had a never heard of a, what a laryngectomy is, no idea. He promised me though, that my quality of life would vastly improve. Once he explained what happens in a laryngectomy, I was in denial. I couldn't imagine living without a voice box and breathing through a hole in my neck. So I stalled. But by the sort of March of 2016, early March, my voice grew very much weaker, my breathing even more labored, and I had to consent to doing the surgery. Now, fast forward about nine months, and after getting through depression and other psychological issues, um, which we're going to discuss later, I went to Don see Dr. Zina again. And out of the blue, he suggested that I make a documentary about the psychosocial aspects of recovering from and living with a laryngectomy. Now, my first reaction was I thought to myself, stick to medicine, doc. I'm the professional here. Just kidding. It was an excellent topic, but I needed a story. So I went home, fired up Google, and quickly discovered a choir in London whose members have all had their voice boxes removed. The choir is part of Shouty Cancer, a London-based charity that specializes in using singing and breathing techniques to improve voice outcomes for laryngectomy patients and thereby improving confidence and self-image. I knew that if I could get all the production pieces together, this would be the, the perfect vehicle for telling the story that I wanted to tell, that of a group of people who despite all the trauma and hardship of this life-altering surgery are living productive, meaningful lives and doing so in a most entertaining fashion. Well, long story short again, I was able to get the choir on board and then was able to find, find five sponsors to help fund the film. Chief among them, Atos Medical and the Thank Foundation, and that's the Thyroid Head and Neck Cancer Foundation. And then the, the fun began. Well, it was hard work too, but the fun began. And then more than two years of making the film, we had a wonderful gala premiere in London with all the cast and the families, about 350 people, other people. And then COVID hit. But so that put a, a crimp in our screening plans and, and distribution plans. But overall, I really found the experience of making the film cathartic and cleansing. Getting to know all the choir members and seeing them rehearse and perform made me realize that I can expand the boundaries of what's possible, even with the limitations I have. And I've made dozens of documentaries in my career, received some awards and accolades, but in really making this film, Can You Hear My Voice, has really been the most rewarding of my career. So in a nutshell, that's it. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing story. And you have a, we have a short clip from uh, uh, the movie that we want to play right now talking about some of the uh, um, inspiration for doing it. And this clip um, just sets up the choir and the premise of the film that we're going to follow them as they prepare for and perform the most ambitious um, concert they've ever attempted. I remember quite well when I first suggested let's form a choir. They responded with laughter and surprise and disbelief. It just seemed ridiculous. How you would expect a group of people with no voice boxes to stand up and sing in a choir. It didn't seem realistic. But Thomas had confidence that we could do something, so we went along with his mad scheme. And then one day it was sort of, now what about a concert? What?
Well, the people in the choir are just normal people. I really admire the courage that it's kind of taken to come through all of their treatment. After all the stuff they've gone through, they're able to turn that into something creative and artistic. And it's really, really impressive. The concept is something new. It's almost a defiance, which is what people need, is to be defiant. Was that a F sharp I sang, or what was it? You know, um, you know, it doesn't matter. Most of them never read poetry before. Most of them never sang before. Most of them never were on stage before. And they're going to put on a show, and they're going to add this other two or three layers of uh, emotional vulnerability. All right, everyone. Just relax, we, we are prepared, right? We know what we are doing, and we're gonna enjoy ourselves, yeah? We're doing a concert. People have paid money to come and see us. The adrenaline in Russia is incredible. I can't describe it, really. I never thought I would do something like this. Yeah, so thank you, Bill. That's, uh, it was an incredible premise. Um, I'm. Uh, amazed it's just an amazing film um i think it just celebrates the the spirit of survivorship that a lot of uh, my laryngectomy patients have, have demonstrated over the years um really inspiring to me um you know in the spirit of sort of you know folks who might be facing down this operation or who might uh um uh might have just recently undergone it. Elliot, can you talk to a little bit about sort of what you were most afraid of going into the surgery um, uh, at the beginning? Elliot, you're on mute. Sorry. When I was diagnosed and we went through some steps and we decided that I had to go through the laryngectomy, um, Everything flashed by me in a moment, in a moment. A life unknown, the level of life that I could have, my family, um, there was a lot of fear. Not knowing how it was gonna turn out. Um, I'm pretty active at work. I speak for a living. I thought that would all go away. I play a lot of sports. I thought that would all go away. There was really nothing very positive in the very beginning when I knew I had to go through the surgery. After speaking to a few laryngectomies, um, they pumped me up. I saw that there was life after the surgery and uh, my mind started to turn around in some of the thought process although you still have the unknown going into the surgery um, but overall I was just thinking I wouldn't have a normal life and people actually would be looking at me and I guess later on, I can tell you what I did when they started looking at me. But, um, but the bottom line is, it was so much unknown and so much fear and so much worry about what's my family going to do because your mind plays games with yourselves. And I was only thinking the worst. So Janice, you're a, you're a, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate that, uh, Elliot. Um, Janice, you've had probably one of the, my one of the patients who's had a laryngectomy um, the longest can you talk a little can you talk about a little bit like what you were concerned about uh, when when it first presented to you that you had to lose your voice box it was uh, I had never met a laryngectomy before either I didn't think and, and it was terrifying really I had two young sons they were 13 and 15 to finish raising and my husband thought I was going to die. You know, we are just all in a, it was horrible. But what really helped was, uh, there is, Jane DeVecchio was uh, president of the Greater Atlanta Voice Masters at the time. And just talking to her, and she visited me right after surgery was 
I was a godsend, and I guess that's why I've still always been involved in the laryngectomy community because it helped me so much and seeing other laryngectomies going on with their lives. And it gave me the courage at a couple of years to go ahead and get my real estate license because that was my plan. And at first I thought, well, there goes that because a lot of talking involved, but I got my confidence back and you know, I've been selling real estate ever since, you know, so it gave me. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. I'm also a patient consultant for in-health technologies. So they let me do that, work it around my real estate. So it works good. It works out good. Yeah. So a great opportunity to meet other patients and, you know, right. make suggestions that can help other patients down the road. That's fantastic. What were the, what were some of the, to the sort of panel in general and what were some of the challenges immediately after the surgery that you experienced? You know, you, you're sort of, you wake up, you know, and you don't have your voice box and you're sitting there with uh, tubes in your neck. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what that first sort of impression was? You want to start with, uh, we can start with Bill. Sure. Um, for me, right after the surgery, immediately after the surgery, um, the challenges were mostly physical um, because of my long-term uh, radiation damage. Tissue heals less quickly. Inflammation takes a lot longer to disappear. So uh, overall, it was really painful for quite some time. Um, the stitches, the drains, the stoma, and the bandages need to be changed and the stoma needs to be cleaned. Um, and that takes some effort. Mostly it was on my wife's part to do that. And I'm eternally grateful to her. Um, after surgery, you produce um, a lot of mucus at the beginning. And that has to be suctioned out at least a few times a day, but, you know, probably more. So we have a, you know, we had a suction machine at home. Again, my wife handled that at the beginning. And I also, for some reason, have a hard time uh, flushing anesthesia out of my system. So I was in a brain fog for about a week or two. And I didn't end up speaking a word for three months after the surgery. Um, I had to wait for the swelling to go down. That was really hard, really difficult. By then, I was experiencing some psychological issues, depression, doubt, and a total lack of confidence, which I think we're going to touch on later. Elliot? I think when I woke up, I had my family around me and the care at the hospital at Emory um, was so spectacular. They were very, very educational for me. And they kept on telling me and teaching me what had to be done when I eventually went home. But I was still in, I'm going to use the word shock also. And I was thinking, I can't talk anymore. How am I going to communicate? And I had a goal about five months after where my daughter was getting married and I wanted to be able to say a speech. So that goal motivated me to do everything that the nurses and the doctors directed me to do, but I was scared. I was never scared in my life. I was scared. Yeah. I didn't know what this would bring. This yeah. was the worst scenario that I've ever gone through in my life, me personally. Um, very, very scary, and it got to a point where I couldn't even look in the mirror. I didn't even want to see what I looked like. I didn't want to see the stitches or the staples or the stoma. I just let everyone around me do what they had to do. And um, I, almost, I almost went into my own world or a cocoon or whatever um, and just laid there for seven or eight days until I knew it was time to go home. Very, very scary. 
Yeah. Lauren, can you talk about some of the things we do in the hospital to try to alleviate that fear? Because I know this happens to a lot of patients. And as, as Bill said, your program is only as good as your, your best, your, your speech pathology team, which we have an amazing speech pathology team. So you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I mean, I think what Elliot said, we are one of your first visitors on day one after surgery. So we come in with um, a bunch of supplies and try and get people communicating that first day with an electrolarynx because we really do value the ability to communicate. And the more we can teach you in the hospital, um, we hope that we can set you up for more success when you go home. So um, we start on day one trying to get patients to take care of their own stoma and wearing heat and moisture exchangers to help with, with breathing and the secretions and really focus on that communication aspect right away. Because like you said, it is, it is, there has to be a way to communicate. So we want to help facilitate that as soon as possible. So I think we have another clip that kind of illustrates kind of what we're talking about. And, and uh, um, Bill, you want to? Yeah, Sarah. Uh, Zara, not Sarah, Zara is the emotional center of the film um, and the character who experienced the distresses and psychological issues, psychosocial issues, the artist in this clip, clip um, she explains it. I have two vivid memories. The first one is just before going down to theatre. And having that realization that when I came back out, I wasn't going to be the same person. swallow properly and losing all my taste with radiotherapy suddenly gone. I think loss of laughter is one of the most difficult things for me. So it's just one thing after another after another and it just, I don't know, it just made me angry all the time. Emotional changes were quite dramatic. She was very, very moody. At times, she just felt that uh, everybody was staring at her, and it just ch changed her personality. We know from evidence that people who've had a laryngectomy can be much more likely to experience anxiety, depression, social withdrawal. So that's a pretty powerful clip. Uh, Janice, is that, uh, can you talk about how that resonates with you a little bit? Not a lot of it's true. I, I remember after my surgery, being in the hospital and I before my swallowing test and my husband came in with a drink and a coke or something I'm like I was so mad at him you know that why are you coming here drinking a coke when I can't drink anything and then he couldn't read my writing a lot of times and he'd be you know and it's just frustrating so I learned I got the uh, Cooper Rand is what I used in the hospital because I had my puncture at the time of surgery. And that's where my feeding tube was. And uh, I got pretty great on that because, you know, just keep writing. You, you can't keep up the conversation very well. And I remember when I first started 
with the speech pathologist uh, getting fitted for a prosthesis and it's like I really didn't want to give that Cooper Rand away because I kind of liked it after getting you get used to it and I got really good on it but she said no you don't need that anymore and um, it just seemed like everything was really hard at first it's like and then all the mucus nobody told me about that it was just Oh my God, you know, but it all kind of calms down. It really takes about a year to get over it mentally and physically, I think. Yeah, yeah. That seems to be sort of the effect or the, the sort of what I've seen with a lot of our patients. It takes about a year. I think there's the physical healing and then sort of the mental healing that takes longer. Um, although, you know, I, 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 I laugh because your uh, speech pathologist showed you some tough love and I know Lauren and I have talked about showing a patient here and there tough love to try to get them to really, you know, embrace the potential. Elliot, do you want to make any comments on that? The first time that I've seen this clip and in the very beginning, I know I wasn't on the screen, but tears were coming to my eyes because it brought me back to where I was. And as strong a guy as I think I might be emotionally very, very tough and crying is good. I learned since my surgery that crying is good and talking is good. Um, you know, but man, I was very emotional and I felt it when I watched it. Yeah. You know, uh, Elliot, um, I've seen that clip in the film, I don't know, 50, 60, 100 times. And I still get emotional watching Sara uh, explain because it all hits home. Um, I was, after my physical recovery, I was you know, still saddled with insecurity and fear and doubt. Um, and I think um, people have had a laryngectomy sometimes tend to retreat from society. And we withdraw into a world where we don't have to see be seen or eat speaker um in public i did that i found it easier to isolate rather than, than navigate i didn't want to go out i didn't want visitors um and of course once we self-quarantine loneliness loneliness and depression are sure to follow and it, it did for me i was i think pretty severely depressed for about six months um losing your natural voice is very dramatic, um, but I was, you know, I'm like Elliot and Janice, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I had a great support. I was blessed to have a supportive network, um, including my wife and family and friends and my laryngectomy support group and to encourage my, um, me and aid me in my recuperation. And along the way, um, my medical team urged me to take control of my own recovery and helped me to do so. Um, in the 15 years I've known my doctor, he's preached about a holistic approach to health that includes traditional medicine, exercise, physical therapy, counseling, um, support groups, nutrition, mindfulness, and just varying degrees, I practice most of those modalities. I went to weekly physical therapy sessions and did daily stretching exercises. I attended two support groups, still do. Uh, when stress crept in, I practiced deep breathing. I started to eat a healthier diet. And I think most importantly, um, I started walking a walking regimen that began with walking, you know, a quarter of a block, half a block, and eventually led to four or five mile hikes six days a week. I wasn't working, so I had, I had the time to do that. And on most of those walks, I got a lot of music therapy in my earphones. And, you know, it's a, it's a slow process recovery. But I, over time, I realized that my life was not over. It was just changed. But it takes time. It takes time. And it's a really hard period to go through. So can you guys talk a little bit about, you know, when you started to emerge from that first year, like what some of the 
some of the, when you started to sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel a little bit, what were some of the inciting events that made you start to feel like you were coming back to yourself? Janice, do you want to start? Uh, I, I think really what got my confidence back, uh, we had a big support group then. And the president, Jane DeBecchio, who's like the St. Teresa of laryngectomies, she had me starting to do some public speaking on educating the kids on tobacco ed. And not just the kids, I went to all kinds of churches and high schools and, and doing the public speaking really kind of helped me and I got a good response from it. So it, it kind of, I tell you, when you help somebody, you help yourself. So it was kind of a win-win. And I started visiting people in the hospital going through the laryngectomy. And uh, then I started thinking, well, you know, you know, maybe I maybe I can get my real estate license, you know, maybe it is a, still a possibility. And so I just practiced on doing the hands-free as well as I could and just started. That was my goal. I had something to, to strive for. And, and I passed my desk first time with a 98. So I'd be getting you know, I'd be good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Now, Elliot, you're a you're a high powered sales executive. When did you start to like really come back? Um, you know, as Bill said, we're one of the lucky ones. And I got a good report about 30 days after I was home, said to myself, what am I going to do? Why am I just laying here and walking around the house? I got to get up. I got to start going to work. I started thinking about work after about, I think, I think it was three months. And um, at that point, my mind changed. But it changed not only because of the way I was thinking, but as we already said, the support that we all were getting from our families, me personally, from my family, um, they pushed, they pushed. And at one time I didn't let them. And then I had no choice because I was tired of fighting them and they kept on pushing me <laughs> and motivating me. You know, so I, um, I attribute my quicker um, time to get out there and get back to a normal life to my family. On the other side of it, when I started to be able to talk about four months to, you know, a month, 120 days after, and that was pretty quick in those days. Um, I pushed myself to go to my office or a couple of locations, and I used that as my therapy, even if it was just for an hour, because I would get tired, and I was still very sore in the neck area, the shoulders, and so on and so forth. Um, and that took quite a while, but... My therapy was my family and going to work and seeing how everyone who worked for me came to me and kept on pumping me up. They're proud of me. We wish the best and all of that. So I had a couple different scenarios that supported me and I'm grateful. Yeah, I think this, uh, I think this next clip really, uh, um, speaks to that quite a bit. Uh, Bill, do you want to introduce the, the next clip? Sure. A little preface based on um, pre-interviews I had with all the choir members. Um, I had developed outlines of story beats of each featured character and how I thought the story would go as we were filming. Um, I had a great story about Bland, about Bug and his wife, Cat. But after we recorded this interview with Bug, and his family, especially his 12-year-old daughter, Lily. I threw out my prepared outline and focused Bug's story on the impact 
of the surgery on a family. And I fell in love with Lily. I'm sure you will do. I didn't really remember that much of how he sounded before, but when I was younger, when he first got a laryngectomy, yeah, um, I kind of thought that he sounded like a robot frog, which I know is kind of offensive, but I kind of found comfort in that, so... <laughs> Why did you find comfort in it? I don't know, it just made me feel like it was like something cool about him. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was just, I don't know. <laughs> I do miss uh, his old voice a bit because that's what he sounded like when we first met. But listening to it now, he sounds like a 20 year old and your voice sounds your age now. So it's cool, mm -hmm. it's fine. When your dad got the laryngectomy, how did you deal with it? I think I was probably more upset than dad seemed because, um, I don't know, I thought that he was really going to die, so, yeah. It's hard, wasn't it, because we, we were always honest with Lily, but no matter how many times we said it was going to be all right, you know, you're going to worry, aren't you? The drain surrounds, so that would be five, seven days after my operation. And Lily, so that didn't scare you, the photo? No, because he was... Well, I don't at, know. At, yeah, at the, at the it scared me a little bit, but in the photo, he's, like, really happy, so... But at the time when we asked Lily, she, she said you were smiling and you had both thumbs up, so... She, you were reassured a bit by that, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Lily, what did you do to try and make your dad feel better during his recovery? I made tea for him. You came and you read me stories. Yeah, I read the other his story. Around, yeah. um, and I made him lots of things as well. Like, I don't know, like little books where he was really amazing. To my favourite person in the world, you are the best, you're my inspiration. I love your facial hair and your moustache presentation. When you were ill, feeling depressed, I knew you'd make it because you're the best. You're kind, you're brave, you're funny too. I'm so happy I have you. I can't believe that you're my dad. It turns out that you're not so bad. <laughs> I keep these by my bed. And when she turns into a teenager and hates me, I shall read them <laughs> regularly. So I think it's interesting that there are... Uh a lot of common themes running through folks' stories. It's, you know, family support, tough love, um, and really the support of other laryngectomy survivors uh, that kind of helps carry folks through. Um, I wonder if you guys could talk about what what is it that you need from the medical side of things after that first year? What were the key things that you really felt carried you through when you started to um, get your feet under you a little bit? I don't know if you wanna start, Bill. Well, um, and you know, a lot of it is sort of ethereal. Um, I felt really supported by my speech therapist and my doctor and my physical therapist. And I didn't want to let them down, you know, but that's not the only reason. I really felt what they were telling me would help me in the long run. And my speech therapist gave me lots of advice, you know, immediately after the surgery, I saw her, uh, every week until I could speak. And she kept, she just kept encouraging me say, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it'll be there. And when I finally spoke and went into a, a meeting with her, uh, an appointment with her, and I said something like, hello, Brenda. She reacted in, you know, a way that like, I had just given her a car or something. She was so happy. She took me around to all the doctors and said, listen to Bill, 
and, and nurses, listen to Bill. That sort of encouragement is really critical, as is access to other modes of therapy, like physical therapy, occupational therapy. I had a nutritionist. I think those are really important at the time where you're not thinking clearly and you need to be told, you know, if you do this, you're going to see a difference. You might not feel better immediately, but you're gonna see a definite difference. And that's why it's such a slow process. But I think the overall thing is you have a team, a medical team, that is really behind you and shows they really care about you. Janice, you wanna comment? Yeah, I, I feel like I was so lucky to be in Atlanta. I had my surgery done in um, St. Joe's. At the time, they had a head and neck floor. Dr. Fred McConnell, you might know if you did my yeah. surgery. He was just the best. And they had a whole, they had a whole uh, clinic there at the time. And it was wonderful. I, I felt very supported by what the treatment I got there, I just can't say enough good things about it. And I, I feel like a lot of the folks that do have a harder time, you know, they don't have that kind of uh, practice with everybody involved. You know, I, I, I think they have a harder time if they don't have access to good speech therapy and I remember talking to a guy who had his laryngectomy in Gwinnett. I didn't even know they did laryngectomies there. And he'd gone a whole year without any kind of speech, not a lary electric larynx or anything. It was just uh, so sad. Yeah, very difficult. Very, I was very fortunate that I was where I was. That's the way I feel. Like, and I pray, get me to the right people. And that's one thing I did get to the right people. I was very supportive. I was very lucky. Elliot. Um, first of all, I feel that I'm very, very lucky at Emory for the entire team. And Dr. Eldiri, I happened to him, the head guy in my surgery. And I remember asking him for him when I was taken into the operation room and he came right up he said here I am and that put me at ease I felt so comfortable with the team and afterwards with the care everyone takes their experience and gave it to me everyone was positive and gave me their feedback you're right on schedule you're a little ahead of schedule you may want to do this. You may want to do that. But because of their knowledge, and they've been through it many times with other patients, it gave me comfort. It gave me a bigger will to keep on going forward. And again, I, uh, Emory man, did the best. And if I get... And Dr. Eldiri, if I can stress one more thing, and I think Emory does it, if I think Emory does this, um, access, easy access to counseling and support groups are, in my view, very critical. Um, I had started to attend a laryngectomy support group through GEC USC, and I found that just um, almost life saving. And it wasn't so much that you know, the advice you get because you get advice and you take some of it or don't take some of it, but it's just the, it's support. And you're talking to people who understand, really understand what you are going through at any single moment in your recovery. So I think that's great if you can get to a facility that offers all of these ancillary services, that's really important. If I can add something, 
you learn in theory. But in real life, it's more than just theory, it's experience, as I said already. And it definitely shows in the care that I was given um, many years ago. And um, I believe that's a big part of what got me through this mental. And Lauren, do you want to talk a little bit about how often we see the patients and, and kind of what we try to accomplish in that first, you know, six months after when we're really doing voice restoration and, and how often we see them after that? Yeah, so um, in the hospital, we start with a daily therapy for electrolarynx use. And then as we start um, the outpatient side, we'll see patients every one to two weeks to really get um, communication moving forward. Um, as patients start approaching, um, looking at a voice prosthesis, that that process, you know, is really sort of dependent on what the patient needs. So some people um, come quite often and, and they're seen quite regularly to make sure that they can get talking as, as effectively as possible. Other patients, you know, they, they pick it up really easily and, and just kind of you know, see us when they need us. Um, I think the goal from our standpoint is give you the tools and, and try and help facilitate independence. So, um, you know, we have that first six months or however long we're seeing you regularly, we really want to give you that tools to be as independent as possible and not attached to the clinic. So um, it, it's quite variable, but our goal is, is effective communication as, as um quick or as long as it takes. Bill, do you want to play the clip from uh, Andrew kind of talking about how he came out of this and started yeah, to recover? Yeah. Now this clip with Andrew appears at the, near the end of the film. When I was doing the interview, he said a line that I immediately knew would make the final gut of the film and be at the end of the film. In fact, after he finished his answer, I said, cut, and I went over and kissed him on the forehead for saying it. You'll probably figure out what line it was, but um, Andrew was uh, an interesting character who went through it uh, all the uh, recovery process on his own. What do you miss about your old voice? I miss the fact that I had it. The voice is only a sound, so it's an instrument, and my instrument is broken. I can't achieve the same notes or the same chords. I can't play the same song. La, 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 la. I'm writing a book. Uh, the book is about the journey of my cancer experience. Not only am I exploring the past, but it is how I choose to interpret it. I am no longer ashamed of being a laryngectomy. Um, I think uh, immediately afterwards I felt very bitter that, that the hand that fate had played me. But writing about it has helped me just to say to myself, you know it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it. Do something with it that's productive. I'm not going to hazard a guess as to which line it was. It, it, it was, I'm no longer ashamed to be a laryngectomy. Um, and I almost yelled gut right after that line to go kiss him, but I had the good sense of letting him finish his answer. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, I think that it's, it's just, there's a lot of hope in, the, in that, um, you know, in that whole, uh, uh, clip. There's a lot of, uh, you know, getting back to being who you are, even without your voice. I, I, I loved his comment that his instrument was broken, um, but he still had it. Um, yeah, yeah. 
he still had his instrument. Um, so I just wanted to ask what, what, you know, what would you guys say, sort of we're coming to the end of our, our webinar here, what would you say to somebody undergoing this operation today or who's scheduled to undergo this operation in the next few weeks? What would you say to them? Elliot, do you want to start? I think it's very important for them to stay as positive in their minds as they can. While staying positive, they also have to push forward so that you improve each day and everything will be okay. I know every patient is different. Um, and they got to stay strong. If they can do all of that and it works and it helps and they have a great support system. I believe, well, I'm going to talk for myself as a laryngectomy. I now have a normal life. This is irrelevant. My life is normal. I do everything I did before the surgery except swim. Yeah. Everything is normal. I play ball. I have sales seminars. And the support that Bill mentioned is important too. There's no doubt about it. It's a bunch of steps. And if they have a plan and we can give them a plan, anyone can do anything that they want to do. It's just a medical thing that sometimes you think you can't overcome. After the surgery and everything turns out fine, you can do anything you want to do. Just go and do it. Yeah. Janice? Oh, when I tell new patients, and this is what I believe, it's not a walk in the park, but it's doable. It, just, it takes time and you just got to put in the work, but it, it's doable. And you can come through this. And it is hard. It is really hard, but it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you would, I tell patients that you're going to be overwhelmed with all the information that's presented to you. And you don't have to remember it all right at that particular second. Um, but the biggest piece of advice I give is, I say, if, if if you had told me seven years ago that I was gonna have my voice box removed and breathe through a hole in my neck, I would have told you that I'm gonna end up in the fetal position on the bed forever. And that's not what happened. And it's not because I'm so exceptional. I think it's because I'm like everybody else. I really want people who are going to have a laryngectomy or indeed any sort of cancer operation to realize that although you may feel weak, although you may feel that you won't be able to handle it, I want you to realize that you are stronger and more resilient than you know. And time will show that. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate all that. I think that's all very poignant. Thank you very much for sharing that. I think from the medical side, what we try to do is just build a net. Um, and I think that's really uh, our, our biggest goal. And we here at Emory, we try to build a net as big and as wide as we can with speech pathologists, nutritionists, dental oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. Uh, and make your access as, as easy as possible. But I think that saying about raising children also applies to surviving cancer and living with cancer afterwards. I think it takes a village. Um, so I think it takes a lot of folks to, to, to carry us through. Uh, we try to provide as much of that as we can um, in our, our multidisciplinary clinic. Um, I want to open the floor up in the last minute or two to any of our uh, participants who wanted to ask any questions. Um, we'd be happy to field questions uh, for a few minutes here. Um, 
Is there anybody who would? I'm not I. Questions, Javier? I, I, I don't see any in the chat. Okay. All right. Well, I just want to take a moment to thank our panelists, uh, thank Elliot and Janice and Bill. I think the film is incredible. Um, I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And uh, I think. Welcome, my pleasure. Yeah, I think this has been uh, an incredible webinar. And, and I think, you know, this will serve as a a guide stone for a lot of patients moving forward who are going to undergo this, this operation. So um, it's, it's my great uh, honor to have been able to participate in this. And again, I think the film is incredible and I encourage everybody uh, to, go, to go see the film. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, how you doing today, Hello. sir? How are you? When Robert Logan was diagnosed with stage four cancer of the soft palate, he did his research about where to go for care. He also knew Winship is Georgia's only NCI designated comprehensive cancer center, giving his team of doctors access to the latest research and clinical trials. What Robert didn't know was that he's experiencing the Winship Way, our next generation approach to cancer care. The Winship Way stresses the integration of research with clinical care and the coordination of services to make the patient experience seamless and comfortable. And the pill that you're taking is part of the clinical trial. Robert Logan sees it and feels it firsthand at one of the first facilities developed by the Winship Way, Winship's Head and Neck Cancer Clinic at Emory University Hospital Midtown. This coordinated care is made possible by a space specifically designed around the Winship Way. The patient comes to a central clinic space where physicians and specialists from a variety of disciplines work side by side. The best thing about this clinic has been the organic interactions that happen on a daily basis. He has done very well participating in this study. Yes. I think that's been really a life-changing process and probably the single best thing that we imagined would happen but didn't necessarily plan for is the single best thing that's come out of this uh, process. The Winship Way also stresses integration of the latest clinical research into patient care, which enabled Robert Logan to be treated in a clinical trial that has changed his outcome. level is okay. I think the Winship Way is really the future of cancer care delivery and I do believe very much that we're setting the standard of how cancer care should be delivered to patients.